morning. Uh, just a quick introduction. My name is Kenneth Boyle, and I'm a recently graduated senior from McDonough School. Starting two weeks from tomorrow, I will be a freshman at Gettysburg College. I've often thought about what I would like to speak about if I ever got the chance to preach. Would I talk about the unconditional love that God has graced us with? Or should I preach about the saving power of God? I must confess that for today, neither of these topics particularly spoke to me. And while both are worthwhile, I have chosen to branch out and pursue a different line of discussion. As I begin a new chapter in my relatively short life, there are a lot of things that seem scary, terrifying, if truth be told. Will I do well in my classes? Will I make new friends who will help me stay true to myself? What kind of job can I expect to have when I graduate in four years? Will I even have a job? <laughs> How much money will I make? Where will I live? All of these questions loom in the back of my mind as I prepare to step outside of the world I've known before. The first thing that came to me is that there are expectations riding on my shoulders. But whose expectations am I carrying? Are they my own expectations, my parents, society's, or God's expectations? I honestly feel as though it is a combination of all of them, and yet society's expectations for us tend to overwhelm the expectations of the others. This causes us to be led astray and lose sight of what God wants for us. God's intentions for us are only good. In Jeremiah 29, verse 11, the Lord says, For I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. In this short passage, God shows us that he will provide for us and, holy moly, and guide us through the challenges of life ahead of us. I have often felt God's plans to prosper me many times, even in the darkest parts of my life. When I was a freshman in high school, my, college, ooh, gosh, my uncle passed away quite suddenly. He had always sent me an original poem for my birthday, and I always looked forward to his huge hugs at holiday breaks. He passed away two weeks before exam review started, and I couldn't concentrate in school. I began praying daily, asking God to help me through the coming weeks, and I honestly don't know how I could have done as well as I did on my exams without the constant support of my friends at school and at Glenmar. I honestly believe that God put each one of those people in my life for a reason. They gave me hope. My uncle's passing was a very, very large challenge in my life. So what are the most common challenges that face us? When we were in kindergarten, it was snack, <laughs> nap time, and of course, recess. Recess was a big thing for us back then. In high school, trying to fit in and making friends can be a major challenge. As I began to do some research for this, it seems as though after you graduate from college, many people find it difficult to find a job that they like, or even a job. For adults in their 40s and 50s, many will find it hard to pay for their children's college educations. Some may begin facing health issues, and yet others may be contemplating retirement. In your 60s, 70s, and 80s, it seems as though many people will worry that their retirement funds will run out. A noted journalist, Carol Fleck, conducted a study among 4,000 Americans between the ages of 44 and 75. Over 60% of these participants said that they feared running out of retirement funds more than dying. Just to be proactive, I'm going to go home after the service, start my RRA, I'll be in good shape. 
Now, I know that I'm definitely not an expert in retirement. I haven't even started. But I know for a fact that God will provide for me. One of the greatest examples of proof to this statement is Jesus' parable of the rich fool. Just to summarize the parable quickly, a rich man has a large harvest of grain, and he fears that he will not have enough space to store all of this. So worrying about the coming years, he decides to do the American thing, tear down those small old barns and build larger barns. Later that very same day, the Lord comes to him and says, sorry, time's up, you're going to die tonight, sorry, didn't mean to do that. So Jesus, at the end of this, tells his disciples, that is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you will have enough food to eat or clothes to wear, for life is more than food and your body more than clothing. Look at the ravens. They do not plant or harvest or store food in barns, for God feeds them. And you are more, far more valuable to him than any birds. Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And if worrying can't accomplish a simple task like that, how can you expect it to solve larger problems? So I don't think this means that we should just throw our hands up in the air and say, God, go ahead and lead my life for me. I think it means very simply that God will be the provider of everything I will ever need. An example of God's promise to us is the 23rd Psalm. Perhaps one of the most well-known scriptures even among non-churchgoers, the 23rd Psalm opens... The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He lets me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Does anybody else get goosebumps when they hear this? I don't know, I could just be going crazy here. For me, this scripture embodies the idea that God is my strength. He washes away my fears. He will provide a future for me and for all of his disciples. Now, since the dawn of mankind, we've always been curious to know what the future will hold for us. I personally do not want to know my future because I'd like to be at least a little bit surprised as I go ahead. Seriously, if you knew everything that was going to happen to you, it would take the joy out of living. However, the future can also be one of the scariest things in the entire world. The mystery of not knowing what is going to happen at any moment is certainly not the most comforting of things. However, God shows us with absolute certainty that nothing and no one can separate us from the love of God. In Romans 8.38, Paul says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. With that kind of promise and certainty, I feel like I can take on anything. I can move mountains, I can fight armies, even go to the furthest edge of the universe and still know that I am loved by a God who will not abandon me, will not give up on me, will not stop loving me. As a person, I know that I'm not perfect. I make mistakes all the time. But God allows us to make mistakes so that we might be able to find him in our hearts. As we heard this morning in Isaiah, I have called you back from the ends of the earth, saying, You are my servant, for I have chosen you and will not throw you away. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. Don't be discouraged, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up 
with my victorious right hand. To me, this passage shows us that God will work personally in each of our lives, even when we lose sight of him. You are never truly alone. You're standing on the shoulders of a giant who will not let you fall. He may let you stray off the straight and narrow path, but he will never let you lose sight of where you're going or where you've come from. Isaac Newton was famously quoted as saying, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. As followers of Jesus, we are standing on the shoulders of the largest giant out there. Some ride on the shoulders of wealth, and others ride on the back of power. Materialism and power, however, cannot compete with the eternal blessings that God will bestow upon us. I believe that it is possible to be rich materially and still be poor in character, poor in love, and poor in our relationship with God. I also believe that you can be poor materially and still be rich in every other aspect of your life. I have most clearly seen this in the people of Hurley, Virginia. Despite the fact that some people who live in Hurley do not have indoor plumbing, and many lack the economic stability to provide for their families, the people of Hurley, Virginia are perhaps some of the happiest people I know. Maddie Christian would joyfully hug any new eighth grader who stepped out of a van to volunteer in Hurley. Her daughter, Teresa, wakes up in the, at five o'clock each morning to prepare breakfast for every single one of our 100 plus volunteers. And the homeowners themselves there welcome us into their homes graciously. And they often ask to be included in our prayer circles and even just to help us on the job site. Now, returning to the idea that God is our giant, I noticed that he doesn't normally choose the people in power to do his works, or even the wealthiest. God often chooses someone who is easily overlooked by society. For example, David, the youngest son of Jesse, was left at home to tend to the sheep while his older brothers went off to fight in the war. When David arrives on the battlefront, he volunteers to fight Goliath, knowing that God is larger and more powerful than any foe. And David, little old David, becomes king many years later. Moses, the prince of Egypt, was a murdering stutterer. He ran away from his life in Egypt, and yet God came to him through the burning bush and chose him to lead the Jews out of Egypt and into the promised land. Saul was persecuting Christians. He is blinded by Jesus and is told to go to Damascus, where he experiences a grand transformation and becomes the Apostle Paul. He went from arresting Christians to leading them and founding new churches. Finally, the last example I'll give you is that of Mary. She was a teenage girl, and out of all the people in the world, God sent an angel to her and declared that she would bear the Messiah. The thing that all of these people have in common is that none of them seems qualified in the opinion of the people around them. God reverses our opinion of who is in control. Often we form ideas of what God should do for us. However, I have found that God does not call upon the qualified. He qualifies those who are called. President John Kennedy once said, ask not what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. I think we can apply this to God and his plans for each and every one of us. I often find myself asking God to do things for me, take away my struggles, solve my problems. And I've recently come to the conclusion that I spend more time talking to God than actually listening to what he wants from me. So how do we go about changing all this? Honestly, I have yet to find a way, and I would be happy to find someone who knows the answer. I think the best way to start is to understand that God is calling you even when you aren't listening. Maybe we need to stop talking to God 
and just let him speak to us. I don't believe that each of us will have a burning bush moment, but I do believe that God speaks through other people around us, through our own life experiences, and through the world around us. So remember these three things when you go home today, or as you experience the mysteries of life. One, do not be afraid, because God will provide. Two, nothing, absolutely nothing, can separate you from the shoulders, heart, and love of Jesus Christ. And finally, remember that God does not call upon those who are qualified. He qualifies the call. Amen.